Hello, welcome to Conway Hall, where ethics matter. Um, we've run Sunday talks since the 19th century, and this is the latest instance, Thinking on Sunday. The mission is to bring ethical thought to the public. And there's a live Q&A after this, so if you would like to ask a question, um, do just put it in the little Q&A bit. Let me know if you want me to ask the question. Some people are a bit shy about appearing on screen, um, but uh, write it in your in your little Q in, in your little text box, and we'll queue them up for later. The format is basically that we will have our speakers speaking for about forty five minutes, and then after that we'll have the Q and A for half an hour to forty five minutes, um, whatever everybody gets going. The talk today is about what does it mean to be human, and what if anything does being a member of the animal species Homo sapiens mean. We've got Charlotte Slay, who's a professor of humanities at the University of Kent. Her background is in the history and philosophy of science. She's published several books on history, culture, and the representation of animals. So you need to go and buy those from your local independent bookshop as soon as you've listened to her speak. Amanda Rees is a reader in sociology at the University of York. She also is an author of books, um, including a fascinating one, The Infanticide Controversy, Primatology and the Art of Field Science, which I'm going to definitely read. So thank you very much for joining us, ladies. Um, can, with that introduction, can I hand it over to you to start talking, please? Thank you so much, Deborah. It's a huge pleasure for Amanda and I here to be here today. Uh, and to tell you a little bit about a book that we recently wrote called Human. And we're going to kind of intersperse our talk. We'll talk for uh, short periods and, and swap over between ourselves. The first part of the talk is called What If? And I'd like you to imagine the scene. The aliens have landed. Their ship settles down into the valley near Mexico City, billowing clouds of dust and leaves. The president of the US and the UN Secretary General jostle subtly to be at the front of the greeting party, to be the first to greet them, to be in literally the most famous photograph ever taken in the history of the world. At the same time, each of them is wondering whether it might not be more wise to hide behind the other. Behind these two leaders stand all the smartest experts in the human sciences to help them understand the newcomers, linguists, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and behind them, just in case, are ranks and ranks of soldiers armed with semi-automatics, grenade launchers, tear gas, and tasers. But to their utter astonishment, the aliens leave the craft and ignore the greeting party completely. No coming in peace, no aggression, nothing. It's like the humans aren't there at all. They seem to melt through the crowd and disappear. Eventually, the humans discover that they were off to the lake where they had some kind of assignation with the axolotls. What a galactic embarrassment, not even to be worthy of a moment's notice. What this little story does is help to highlight how we conflate the category of human with a value judgment about superiority or importance. We assume the aliens would want to make contact with humans because, well, humans are the most important species on the planet right? One's reminded a little bit of the old Flanders and Swan song, the English are best, except now it's the humans, the humans, the humans are best. I wouldn't give tuppence for all of the rest. For thousands of years, philosophers have asked what humans are. It's a pretty safe assertion to say that, along with that tree falling unheard in the forest, the question has not yet been definitively ticked off their to-do list. In recent years, the question has taken particularly sharp form in connection to artificial intelligence, AI. As AI begins to develop abilities in fields that apparently re require artful discrimination, the borderline between human and other 
has begun to look rather thin. We know that we are human, but we are not sure what a human is. In the recent history of the West, at least, and this is what Mandy and I argue in our book, when we ask what it is to be human, we implicitly mean, what are these best creature humans? And what exactly is it that makes us the best? It's very much a circular kind of reasoning since it implies it assumes superiority. And then it goes looking to discover what form that superiority takes. It is, to put it in technical terms, a form of exceptionalism. It's a kind of exceptionalism that tends to focus on one of the key things that, that we in the West kind of always want to pick out as, as, as demonstrating the human superiority. And that's intelligence. It's the brain. It's the capacity to think. It's, the, it's, it's a cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But to go back to Charlotte's example of the visiting aliens, I mean, there are a lot of other things that other species are best at. Um, I'm sure lots of people have seen that cartoon where the intelligence test for um, a range of different creatures from fishes to humans to whales to um, tigers is, well, go and climb that tree over there. Which animal is going to do it best? Well, it's the animal that's actually been able to decide on what form the test will take. So, I mean, think it through. If we're going to be exceptionalist in terms of sheer numbers, then, you know, E. coli might come out immensely stronger than the than the, the creatures on which the E. coli live. Um, in terms, if you wanted to think about it in terms of adaptability, another thing that we tend to pride ourselves on, well, bacteria have a much larger capacity than we do to evolve and adapt, and viruses have an even better capacity, as we've just seen demonstrated to great political and emotional significance over the past nine months, ten months, I've forgotten how long the pandemic's been happening. Um, geological significance, earthworms, the role that they play in building the planet, literally building the earth that we stand on. They're the architects of the earth's crust, after all. Or you could think about it in terms of the oldest species. I'm not quite sure what that would be. I think, Charlotte, did you suggest the tadpole shrimp as the oldest of all the continuously existing species? That's what Wikipedia told me. <laughs> <laughs> That's here for Wikipedia. Um, what else do we pride ourselves on? Corporation. Well, ants are better, let's face it, or honeybees, or then let's face it again, how much do we depend on the capacity of the bee uh, to, to fertilise the plants? So what we're trying to get at here is the way in which you, the, the, the ideas that we tend to select as demonstrating the significance or the defining characteristics of, of humanity, they can all be challenged in different ways and would be if an alien were to visit. But we can do it to ourselves as well. You can achieve a similar sense of discombobulation by kind of looking at our past existence. And that's one of the things that we explore in one of the book's chapters. We want, people have always been keen um, on identifying not so much Adam and Eve, but a desire to identify the very first humans. I mean, any paleoanthropologist will tell you they don't want to identify the youngest ape. They want to find the oldest human because that's what carries all of the funding and all of the news value and all of the fame. So people question, could this newly, newly discovered fossil be the very first human? But how would you make that distinction? If that's human, then what was its mother? You know, the more one pursues this line of thought, the more it just becomes a little bit absurd. And the fact that we know that multiple human kinds or multiple members of the genus Homo have existed, we know that we've coexisted with different kinds of humanity as well. We can be pretty certain about this. There's always the question about what happened to the original hominin inhabitants of Europe, the Neanderthals. What happened when Homo sapiens arrived from Africa and encountered that? our closest cousin, the, that, that other kind of, of, of be, the, that other way of being human. What did we do? Did we make love or did we make war? Now, while lots of people thought the genocide and that this might have been the first genocide, there's now a considerable body of evidence that suggests that there's genetic evidence for interbreeding, the strong evidence of DNA flow between humans and Neanderthals. And you could kind of challenge that as well. You know, interbreeding doesn't after all have to be consensual. 
the most fascinating, one of the more recent discoveries about our relationships, or the relationships that may have existed between Neanderthals and, and, and um, ancestor humans, is that when a researcher sequenced the DNA of dental plaque found in a Neanderthal tooth at a Spanish site, what she found was evidence of a microorganism that exists still in our own mouth, right? And it's not old enough to have always been shared. It must have been transferred relatively recently, relatively recently in, in, in um, uh, prehistoric terms. And one route for that transfer could be kissing. So the genetic evidence of interbreeding between the two kinds has led some scientists to suggest that Neanderthals, rather than being called Homo Neanderthalis, should be called Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis. Again, you know, that leaves us then as Homo sapiens sapien, again, focusing and stressing on our intelligence. And you could say, well, all right, it's quite safe in many ways to explore this in the context of the past. You know, we can make kind of, um, we, we, we can think about fictional almost explorations of what happens when different kinds of humans or humans and quasi humans come together. But if we go back for a minute to Charlotte's idea about the aliens landing, let's have a little think again about how, when, you know, after the, um, after the xenopsychologists had finished discussing the philosophy of water or whatever with the axolotls, maybe they might turn their attention to the crowds of humans who were basically begging for some attention. What would they make of us? What would they make of our claims to distinctiveness? We're actually quite happy to say that we are we share a considerable proportion of our DNA with chimpanzees. I can't count the number of books that exist on my shelves that say things like, you know, the third chimpanzee species or 99% chimpanzee. But again, intriguingly, despite the fact that we acknowledge the closeness of our relationship to chimps, their scientific name remains pan troglodytes. The genus name is pan. Our genus name is homo. Their genus name is pan. We are not just saying that we're a different species. We're saying that we belong to different genera. But we're as closely related to chimpanzees as lions are to tigers. And lions and tigers exist in the same genus, panthera. So really any objective classification would want us to call ourselves either pan sapiens or to call chimpanzees homo troglodytes. But the thing is we can't be objective in that way about ourselves. It's very hard to try and define what humans are. And that in many ways is where the book that Charlotte and I wrote started from from this question of the prospect of negative definitions. So maybe it's time to take a rain check on the question of what humans are and ask instead, what are human beings not? And when we dig just a little, we discover that humans are forever busy finding answers to that riddle. Humans are a little bit like X, except we're different in respect of Y. That's the general formula. And it was in a similar kind of mode that Alexander Pope famously lamented that he was in doubt to deem himself a god or beast. There are many categories that we marshal as exemplary non-humans, the better to define what humans are, of which Pope names two, gods and animals, and we could add machines and aliens and all the other chapters that are in our book, these are all key examples of things that we're not, but things which we use as a touchstone to confirm us in our humanity. Humans are like animals, but importantly different in some respects, and so on. Or at least that's the usual way of making the comparisons. There's always, almost always a sly human superiority in these counterpoints. Humans are not animals, because we're more rational. We're not machines because we're more spiritual. And we're not aliens because we don't have green skin or grotesquely bulbous heads or whatever it is. Beasts in particular have long been an important category of the almost human that has helped us to define, by contrast, humanity. 
And there's a lot that we can learn from these efforts to draw a line between animal nature and that of human beings. And I do think that um, as we read, you know, newspaper articles very, getting very excited about, you know, is AI human? Could it uh, rise to humanity? That actually, if you go back and look at some of these historic questions being asked in relation to animals, in many ways, it's the same things that are being worked through there. Many cultures have been keen to assert that, an that humans are in some senses like animals, but in other senses, the most important ones, the exceptional ones, not like them at all. Taoist teaching, for example, suggests that something special, often translated as understanding, generally exists in humans alone. In Christian theology, only humans have souls. And if we look at the work of the sciences over the last 400 years or so, we see uh, very strong attempts to draw and police that, that line between animals and humans. So we can go all the way back to Rene Descartes, who um, famously really compared animals to something like a sort of an animated machine. Um, and then there's a, there's a whole quite ugly history of um, vivisection that was inspired by that, the sense that it, it doesn't matter because animals don't feel, uh, they don't have consciousness, they don't have the same rationality that we do. And I think one of the really interesting things is that even in the wake of Darwin, indeed in the immediate wake of Darwin and his, um, and of course other biologists, his um, you know, very strong claim that humans and animals are a part of an evolutionary continuum. In the wake of that, we see the work of psychologists like Morgan, who, who really doubled down and insisted, no, we mustn't give these qualities of rationality to animals. We must keep them uh, separate. We must presume that they are responding in a mechanical manner. So it's, it's very striking how, how hard that work has been in Western culture made to maintain that distinction, even in the face uh, in some senses, of, of uh, very contradictory evidence from evolutionary interrelatedness. The strange thing and the upsetting thing that these counterpoint categories, a human is like an animal but not an animal, do additional work within the species of Homo sapiens. They allow us to fence off fellow members of the species as subhuman. We compare other humans to animals, and then we're allowed to think of them as not fully human. So ethnic groups are routinely labelled beastly, alien migrants as illegals. Defining the human by the non-human leads to some pretty dark places. Beast or brute was a favourite 18th and 19th British, British epithet, uh, eight, sorry, 18th and 19th century British epithet of sub humanity and it did go through a phase of being quite a funny word it's quite an Ian the Blyton word isn't it but uh, calling someone a beast is if a recent spat among the real housewives of Beverly Hills is anything to go by still one of the most genuinely shocking insults in the lexicon less comic examples of the attribution of beastliness unfortunately abound Victorian British scientists created evolutionary ladders in which the so-called lower races were closer to the animals, their bestial nature supposedly demonstrated by, via skull measurements, categorizing them as low brow. In the 19th and 20th centuries, humans were displayed alongside animals in zoos and science expos. Fairgrounds and circuses exhibited persons of colour as the missing link between the human and the ape. Nazi propagandists compared Jews to cockroaches. Using the animal to police boundaries within Homo sapiens, between the beastly and the truly human, is not only a Western phenomenon. The Taoist model, too, entails the possibility that a person can nevertheless fail to be truly human. Not all humans have that crucial quality of understanding. They may have the mind of a brute. Hate speech directed against the Rohingya minority in Myanmar refer refers to them as non-human dogs. Once a human has been affirmed as beastly, they can be excluded from the obligation to treat them as if they were one of us. Pest control is not, so the argument implicitly goes, the same thing as genocide. 
And there are a couple of interesting words, well, there are many interesting words in the points that Charlotte was just raising there. I mean, she talked about understanding. She talked about persons as well as humans. And just as it's possible to police the boundaries of species within Homo sapiens sapiens, so too it's possible to recognise personhood in individuals that don't belong to Homo sapiens sapiens. The relationship that we in the West have with companion animals, particularly dogs, we are willing to assign quasi-person status to individual animals. We're willing to spend huge amounts of money on gourmet pet food. Um, we're willing to provide them with graves and with coffins and to memorialize them in the same way that we would memorialize members of our own families. And that growth in the willingness, in the capacity, and in, and in the, the, the kind of the social support, the social and cultural support for the identification of particular kinds of animals as people, has gone alongside another shift in the way in which scientists have understood relationships between humans and animals. Charlotte mentioned the history of vivisection and the whole unpleasant um, kind of Cartesian model of animals as, as automata. But since the 1960s, paralleling, as I say, this growth this in, in recognising the personhood of pets in the West, ever since the 1960s, we've seen an increasing willingness on the part of scientists who are studying the behaviour of animals in the wild, which is incidentally what the Infanticides and um, Controversies in Field Science book is all about, Deborah, if you, when you pick it up and look at it, is scientists who are engaged in doing these kind of long-term studies of animals not living on and in human houses or in human in, in human contexts but living as they would have done without humans being around what they've recognized is that animals not only have culture they have sociology they have an individual animals have a history of their own. They, have, they remember what's been done to them. They remember not just what's been done to them, but relationships that exist between other animals. Whether we're talking about primates or elephants or lions or sheep, what you can see here is scientists recognizing the existence of animal agency and treating animals as characters, treating animals as people, treating animals as persons. Alongside that, of course, does also lie the danger of dehumanising the people who live alongside them, particularly since many of these animals, elephants, primates, lions, are under threat because of what the Anthropocene or the age of the Anthropocene is doing um, in the age of the climate emergency. So this question of you know, whether can you assign personhood to non-humans has consequences for the way in which we interact with other people. If you look again in the context of British society um, or rather Western society more generally, the creatures that are most or the individuals that are most often that we most often extend this kind of quasi person category to are, are dogs and horses and dogs in particular, particularly dogs that operate in support roles, whether that be in the domestic setting or whether that be in the military setting which again tells us something about the importance of power in being able to assign personhood. And ironically, one very interesting argument that's developed recently, again, about what happened to our close cousins, the Neanderthals. Sorry to obsess about the Neanderthals, but they really are, the, culturally and scientifically, they are the most fascinating category. One of the arguments is that rather than killing them off or loving them to death, Homo sapiens just outcompeted them. And what enabled us to do that was not our intelligence. It wasn't anything specific to us. Instead, what it was, was our emergent relationship with quasi dogs. It was that connection, that emergent, collaborative, interspecies relationships where two different kinds of hunters, two different kinds of people were able to supplement and to support each other. And as a result, what they did was change the world. They created a sea change in the way in which these proto-humans, these proto-dogs inhabited the world and changed the world itself. They could, we could out, we could outcompete other humans. I find this fascinating. We could outcompete other hominids because we'd learned to recognize dogs as people or as individuals, as individual persons. 
And one of the things I find most fascinating about it is the way in which it challenges some of our most potent assumptions about the nature of humanity and our understanding of human prehistory. People that have read um, the history of anthropology and indeed anthropology students today will know just how important that narrative of man the hunter has been in both academic and popular culture. You know, it, it, cro it crops up, I can't even begin to list the number of places that it crops up in cartoons and children's stories, in popular science, even to the extent where you know such defining characteristics as our intelligence you know that 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 thing that's supposed to make us stand out the defining characteristic that's tied to the fact that it was hunting that meant we needed to develop that intelligence that need to keep track of many dimensional geographic and spatial and social relationships means our brains had to get bigger to fit all of this information in it so hunting is supposed to be one of the reasons why humans became intelligent but what if our abilities at hunters, as hunters were actually, were actually down to our ability to reach out to another individual, to reach out to another individual, identify common cause and work together despite difference? And that recognition of, or that capacity to confer humanity on another, on another, on another being is again a central part of what Charlotte and I were trying to discuss and, and to do with the book itself. So let's just recap where we've come so far in this short talk. We started by looking at human exceptionalism and how our efforts to define the human often smuggle in that assumption of our own specialness, our own superiority. And then we've looked at the attempt to define humans through difference, through difference from uh, another category that is similar, but different. And we've used animals as that example. Um, and that's just one example. This, this isn't a book about animal rights. Um, we, as such, we, we, we look at lots of different examples. So we look at uh, machines, uh, females, aliens, Neanderthals, or all of those or hominins, all of those uh, different groups um, that we have attempted to uh, compare and contrast with humanity to define um, and, and reinforce the notion of humanity. Gods are also in there as well. Those are the outlier. We could talk about those in the in the Q&A. They work slightly differently. And um, we've emphasized how, strangely enough, when we use those um, bounce off categories to define what makes human they end up uh, reverberating within humanity and we end up bracketing off some members of our own species as subhuman or less than human because uh, when we're asking this question about the nature of humanity we're asking a question about as well as asserting our exceptionalism we're asking a question about whom to include in our web of privileges and obligations and as Mandy began to open up there towards the end of her section, um, that's a, actually a very exciting ethical framework if we turn it outwards towards others. And it may indeed be um, that ability to extend our web of privileges and obligations towards dogs that um, enabled humans to become su such a successful species. So this final section of the talk, which both Mandy and I will take a turn at, is called Imhumanism. What if we began instead by choosing to extend inclusion within the web of privilege and obligation and then look to see what happens to the category of humanity? Rather than seeking to understand who counts as being on the inside of our set as a condition of extending consideration to them, what if we began by presuming humanity? Our book proposes imhumanism as the name for this philosophy. Imhumanism holds that humanity can never be identified. You can never say, I've got it, and still less, they haven't. Rather, humanity exists in the act of conferral. It's a little like the concept of priority on the road, in that one can never claim it, but only cede it to another. But even that metaphor doesn't quite work. Since, you, since on the road, you, somebody takes that priority when you give it to them. But humanity can't be grasped once it's been conferred or ceded. 
It exists in the relationship, not in the giver or the receiver. Imhumanism has roots in the work of the philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy. Nancy wrestles with the problem of being or existence. That's the question that he's one of the questions he's very interested in. And he points that it makes uh, points out that it makes no sense as a property since one cannot point to existence without pointing to a thing that exists. The same can be said of humanity. We can't point to its existence outside of humans. And when we use categories such as the animal to define what it isn't, we end up folding in on ourselves and excluding some fellow species members from humanity. Nancy solves this problem through what he calls the philosophy of being in common. The infinitely complex world, says Nancy, is constantly folded upon itself and where its edges touch, then a thing comes into being or in his terms is delineated. Its existence is made manifest and its essence, the nature of itself, is asserted. So, concrete example, when a particular adult has a particular relationship with a particular child, a mother comes into being, it comes to exist, and it's revealed as a particular kind of thing. It has an essence through that relationship. The child, the adult, touch together in reality, and a thing, a mother, comes into existence or a Briton, we could say, is delineated at passport control. Thus, the nature of a thing for Nancy is an immanence, an ever-present potential quality that is exposed to being in relationship. Humanity, we argue, can be regarded in much the same way. Imhumanism holds that humanity is not a quality that can be described or pointed to either in the abstract or within the humans that contain it. It's not something that can be searched for in the human as though it were separable from it or found to be absent in some individuals. Most certainly, it cannot be identified and affirmed in oneself. Humanity is created, or in Nancy's terms, delineated in the act of being given away. That's what it is. There is a spiritual tradition closely allied with the paradoxical suggestion that humanity appears in an act of conferral. It's a Christian tradition that holds that Christ's apotheosis, his rising to godhood, was paradoxically rooted in his, very, in his renunciation of that very divinity. And there's a famous passage that St Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians. Though Christ was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Therefore, and it's that therefore that I think is interesting, there's a kind of a logical connection there in the writer's mind. God also highly exalted him. And it's the Eastern Orthodox Church that has really uh, taken this doctrine known as kenosis uh, and made it central to its spirituality, much more than in the West. Humans, they hold, are created in the image of God, but it is only by emptying themselves of their humanity that they can share in God's divinity. So I find that a very interesting um, way of thinking about a similar move to that we're trying to make in inhumanism. In yeah, I mean, as you were talking, Charlotte, I was thinking, going back to the point I was making about the way in which we've used fiction and the imagination to explore potential relationships between different kinds of humans. Um, and one of the things that comes out of that very, very strongly for a lot of authors, um, I'm thinking in particular of a book um, by Jean Brule, Le, um, my French is dreadful, so I apologise in advance to anyone, uh, Les Animaux de Natures, or Ye shall know, You Shall Know Them, I think is the English translation, where they're exploring, again, relationships between different kinds of hominins um, and using the experience of divinity or the capacity for transcendence as, as a means of recognising personhood or identifying personhood. Um, but to go back to the more practical and pragmatic examples of inhumanism at work, I, mean, I think we, 
I, just, I mentioned some of these in relation to the companion animal relationship um, and the capacity of, of, of scientists studying animals living in the wild to recognize the personality, if not necessarily the human humanity. And I think that's something that they would resist very, very strongly as, as, as a description of what they're up to. Um, for some people, the attribution of personhood to animals is, however, an indicator of psychological integrity. And conversely, there's lots of research showing that childhood abuse of animals in childhood is a predictor of adult human violence. What that leads me towards is the conclude not the conclusion that's too strong a word it's an indication of the extent to which we use non-humans to teach us how to be human or we use animals to teach us how to be humane the development of the capacity to be humane towards other members of homo sapiens is tightly connected to the capacity to exercise that sense in relation to other species and it's not just confined to pet species, of course. I mean, we live with many examples of different domestic animals. And one of the things that's always struck me again as a historian of science is, and a historian of human-animal relationships is I always wonder what would have happened to all of those um, discussions of all of those, all those efforts at vivisection, um, all of those stories of animals as automata, as animals not having agency. A lot of that I always slightly cheekily want to put down to the fact that the standard laboratory animals are rats and pigeons. That is to say animals that we can control simply by the fact that we're bigger than them. You know, that the, the, they literally they fit into the palm of our hands. I wonder what scientists might have had to say about the notion of animal agency and the capacity of animals to, 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 to act on the world if the standard lab animal had been pigs, for example, rather than pigeons. I think that could be quite interesting to think about. Certainly, even within the West, most of those who work with, daily with large animals, with horses, with cows, with pigs, they take their individuality and their personality as a matter of course. They accept the fact that they have preferences, that they have desires. If you're working with large animals, it matters. You need to know which cow is scared of metal gates and which cow is perfectly happy to walk through wooden gates. It makes your life easier apart from anything else. And in humanism, we would want to suggest doesn't need to stop at the living. There's a Maori tribe in North Island, New Zealand in 2017, who succeeded in having a river, which they regard as their ancestor, written into law as a living entity with legal status. In ordinary language, they made it into a human person. I wonder, given some of the articles on today's papers about the importance of protecting statues and the human rights of statues, whether or not we're gonna see something similar happening um, um, in, in this country. Now, the move in New Zealand wasn't without resistance because many were troubled and they were provoked by this extension of humanity because a river can't use the legal rights that humans can. It can't be educated. It can't be punished. You, know, you can't punish a river for flooding. You might want to punish a river for flooding. Speaking as somebody who spent a lot of time living in York, I can definitely empathise with that, but you can't. But it is already the case that we do have some non-living entities given quasi-human rights and responsibilities in law, businesses and companies. A river is no less well enmeshed in our web of needs and obligations. I think we could keep going on this question of inhumanism for, for quite a while, but I'm inclined now to pause maybe unless Charlotte wants to finish up and perhaps open this question up for broader discussion. Charlotte? That's fine by me. Thank you ever so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, I, it wasn't until you mentioned it just uh, a moment ago, Amanda, of course, that I just remembered, of course, businesses do have lots of privileges of personhood in our legal system in the UK. Um, so it's, it's actually, when we think about it, we do apply these kinds of ideas, whether we're aware of it or not. Thank you ever so much. I, I got a comment from um, Catherine Hewlett um, about, it was at about uh, the half past mark, does this concept go on across all the human species? And I was wondering, Catherine, do you remember what the concept was there? Do you want to contribute? Do you want to ask? 
Yes, I'm, I, thank you very much for inviting my, my question. And my Zoom is not great at the moment. Um, it, I was absolutely fascinated by that concept about, it's not about intelligence at all. It's about our link with another species, which are dogs. And it, and, and it made me realize that there was another concept, which is shamanism, which goes across all human species for some reason, quite separately in this world. Now, is it the case that this, is, this, this has gone across all human species in this world, this relationship between humans and dogs? Sorry, I was just trying to find my unmute button there. I just moved the screen across. And of course, in the traditional setup with Zoom, you're trying to find the unmute button and find um, the relationship, so the, the example that I was giving there um, is based on uh, work by an anthropologist called Pat Shipman, who wrote, I think, in 2017, maybe, some, the seven, around about that time, a book called The Invaders, um, which was looking at that very early encounter or that posited early encounter between Homo sapiens and, and with and Neanderthals. And her suggestion there was that it was the it was the relationship um, that the emergent relationship with dogs that enabled the success of humans within the continent of Europe. More broadly, I think it's generally accepted that the the dog was probably the first of all of the animals, certainly all of the animal species, to be domesticated. It, we have a longer relationship with dogs than we have with any other mammal species. I won't say with any other animals, because of course there are many microorganisms living on and in us that we have a much closer and possibly more an intimate relationship with. But certainly dogs are the, the mammal species that we have the longest intimate connections with. Now, culturally speaking, dogs play very different roles in different cultures. So whereas for us in the West, um, we think of dogs as, 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 as companion animals. Um, in some contexts, we think of dogs as friends or as colleagues um, or even as fellow officers. Um, there are innumerable examples um, of dogs being given um, funerals, military funerals um, with, you know, with, with, with national flags being folded in exactly the same way that you would do for a human officer. In other cultures, they have a significantly less well-respected role. Um, and in some cultures as well, of course, dogs, dogs are, uh, well, we know that dogs are eaten. They're usually eaten in a very special way, which intriguingly also seems to attest to the specialness of dogs that they are eaten in order to give health, specific kinds of health to the family, to the people that are eating it. So that you wouldn't just eat dog in the same way that we would eat chicken. You would eat dog in order to uh, perform a particular function, to welcome a particular individual into your family, which I think is equally intriguing. So the relationship between us and dogs goes back longer than any other um, non-human relationship, I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would say. Um, the current cultural status of dogs is, is widely variant across human cultures. Charlotte, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, that was a, a, a really uh, helpful answer. There's another super book, um, a recent one by Alice Roberts, that talks about the development of a, a number of species that kind of... Um, co-evolved with hum humanity if you like and one of one of her chapters there is about dogs I forget the name of the book I'm afraid somebody might the hive mind might come up with that in a minute put it in the chat it, again it was only a couple of years ago um I think untamed says Mandy maybe um the I, I was also another thing that uh popped into mind uh was a very a very strange book that just celebrated its 40th anniversary last year uh, and it's a book by Russell Hoban called Ridley Walker, which is about uh, a kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, human, I mean, society is a strong word. They're, they're living in these kind of very feral bands, sort of trying to rebuild civilization. And one of the one of the key qualities in the, the hero character is the fact that he's so-called dog friendly. Uh, and it's his ability to form this kind of, in some ways, very practical, in other ways, quite mystical connection with dogs that is the sort of the secret of his uh, of his success, such as he has. I think I think that you raised the question about shamanism there and other species, and I am very sure that you're right there. And I wish I knew more about that um, different people group who form these very intense bonds with animals that. 
uh, live alongside them, that are environmental indicators for them or species that they hunt. Um, so I, yes, I'm very sure that you're that you're right that there are other examples there that we could point to. And Mandy's come up with the name of the Alice Roberts book. It's Tamed. She's quite right. Well done. Yes, well, thank you. Very, so, thank you very much. Okay, we've got another point. We've got a point here from um, John Dowdle, if you're still there, John. Um, it's about non-human animals having personalities. Here we go. John, are you there? Right, John doesn't appear to be there right at the moment, but the question he asked, the point he made was that non, many non-human animals have personalities, but that doesn't make them human-like persons. Yeah, I would entirely agree with that. Um, and one of the key things that again comes out of these studies from the 1960s is the is, is the amazing efforts that scientists have made to be to, is, is to study non-human persons, if I can put it like that, um, to get to get away from anthropocentrism, not to be anthropomorphic, but to, in the words of David Lack, um, an Oxford ornithologist who was also a committed, um, well, not just an evolutionist, but also a committed Anglican, in the words of David Lack, to see the world through the eyes of a robin in his famous 1950s studies. of to, So to be able to look at the world through an animal's eyes. Um, again, there's another quote, you know, if, if, uh, if a lion could talk, we could not understand him, said Wittgenstein. But the point of what these scientists have done is explicitly to, to, to basically say, well, of course, you know, a lion isn't going to be able to talk. But that doesn't mean that we can't try to look at the world from a lion's eyes, to try to empathise. So to try and write, to think about what it might be like to write histories from the horse's point of view, to write horse stories in that sense. And I've nicked that from somebody. It's a quote and I can't remember the author. I will put the author in the chat if I, if I can remember it. Um, and next when Charlotte takes over in a minute. Um, but to imagine, well, what would it be like, you know, if, if you were, if in, if in reporting on an encounter between individuals, that encounter wasn't just inflected by the conversation that you were having and what you could see that the, the facial expression of the persons the individuals you could see and what you could cheer but what you could smell you know how would you be able to tell lies more than that if you could smell that somebody else had just been there that wasn't physically present that wasn't visible to your eyes or to your ears i mean we humans can't do that we're too useless you know our noses don't work in that way but how would it change the way in which we interacted and the way in which we understood relationships if you had to take into account that immediate temporal sense? So yes, I entirely agree with what, with, with what John has said. And I'm, I'm constantly amazed by the capacity of these field scientists to take a step outside the human head and, and to make that emotional leap into looking at the world through the eyes of an animal. Charlotte, I'm sure you want to come in while I look at the person that I plagiarized inadvertently. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what, what you've expressed there is a very, uh, you know, very sort of common response so that yes, they have a personality, but does, that doesn't make them human. And the point that we're trying to make in the book is that um, or with this concept of inhumanism is that um, that that's the kind of question that we're very tempted to ask, but but doesn't in the end get us anywhere very useful sort of, you, you know, it sort of presumes this essence of, um, you know, something and uh, of humanity and some, you know, do animals match up to it or do they not? Mm, probably not. But and then the danger with it is that we then, you know, use those same categories to actually exclude members of our own species from humanity. So I guess we're trying to get away from asking that question, you know, it, yes, but is it human? Uh, and, and instead, work with this um, imaginative or ethical imperative um, to, to begin by extending humanity um, in, in, in that moment of relationship and, and, and letting it exist in that moment of relationship. Um, and, and some of the ex examples we were talking about in relation to the, the previous question then kind of make sense with that. Um, and have... we... Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say, we, we have a point from Stephanie as well. Are you there, Stephanie? Hello. Yeah. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yes. Um, well, I, I wrote in my little chat question that I've always understood that 
um, the thing that separates us as humans is our ability to have language. Is there any evidence that non-humans, I know there is sort of whale song and that sort of thing, but is there any evidence that non-humans have it a more sophisticated form of language that we just haven't come across yet properly or is being studied, anything like that? Who wants to go first, Charlotte? Charlotte, you muted. You muted. I thought I'd got so good at Zoom. There we go. Um, that's something that we talk about quite quite a bit in the book. Um, it, it's it's been a really hot topic through um, through the history of of science. You know, do animals have language or not? There's a there's a lovely. Um, little exchange. The the early modern philosopher John Locke, um, who who wrote some of the uh, earliest really important sort of liberal philosophy, and he he reports a story about a parrot in Brazil. Uh, and and this is how it goes. The, so the human asks, "Where do you come from?" And the parrot replies, "From Maranan." What do you do there? I look after the chickens. <laughs> you look after the chickens? Yes, me. And I know how to do it well. And then the parrot makes a clucking noise. And, um, and, and, and Locke, this great philosopher, he's obviously really uh, kind of bothered by the story. He says, well, well, that's just something for the naturalists to think about. But he's felt compelled to tell the story. Um, and you know he's you can sort of read in his text he's he's really troubled you know if if this is true this is really problematic for everything in his philosophy but uh, did you ever read the doctor do Doolittle books when you were a kid yeah do you remember that he was taught to speak animal by his parrot polynesia because the whole point was that polynesia was multilingual she could speak across species that's right so uh, so there was a very famous parrot called alex uh, it was a gray parrot who um, apparently learned to uh, to use a lot of words and to actually marshal abstract concepts reasonably well and it was a very uh, controversial story and the her uh, Alex's uh, trainer was considered to have too uh, emotional a relationship with this parrot for, for it to count as science that's a really interesting thing in the same way that Rachel Carson was kind of written off by um, many other scientists and politicians at, at the time of her writing on DDT that it was too emotional and we mustn't count this as science. So um, it's, it's been through waves that, you know, there was a real wave of trying to prove that animals have language in the 1960s and some very strange experiments giving LSD to dolphins and things. Uh, very weird, very weird, kind of all mixed up in that strange CIA research and things like that. Um, so it's... It's, it's still highly contested. Mandy will tell us now about signing gorillas and cocoa. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I could tell you all about signing gorillas and cocoa. Um, I think the point that I want to make, though, is more to do with the what Charles was just touching on there, the fact that um, certain kind of efforts to investigate the capacity of animals to speak are dismissed as, well, you can't depend on them because the people that are doing it are a bit too emotional, a bit too girly if I can even go that far. Um, the point though, if you look at the history of the ape language experiments, um, which basically kick off in the 1950s and are pretty much finished really um, by the early 1980s, the whole point behind those ape language experiments was that the idea was that you had to bring up the chimpanzee infants as if they were human. Right. If you look, if you Google them, then you'll see the the chimps are you know they're, they're dressed in diapers, they're dressed in infant clothes, they are being brought up in an enriched environment. The argument being that basically we wouldn't expect a human baby to talk if you just brought a human baby up in a cage. Bring them up as if they are human, and maybe we can teach them to use sign language. It would take much too long to go into detail about all the very, very big problems that people have raised with that series of experiments. But it's notable that the one experiment that did, that, that basically blew the others out of the water, the work that Herbert Terrace did with um, Nim Chomsky, which is, a, um, which is a, a play on the words Noam Chomsky, obviously, that experiment did not treat Nim as if 
he was a human in the sense that he didn't have one carer that he was attached to. There were numerous different people coming in and out. And one of the arguments that was put forward was, well, of course, Nim can't use language. He's never been loved. He's never been loved enough. And intriguingly, and in a sense, heartbreakingly, Charlotte mentioned Alex, the grey parrot, who I find terrifying. You know, this thing doesn't have a cerebral cortex and it can count and it can speak. And it's not a question of sign language because it's a parrot. He's actually talking. Um, he died a few years ago. Um, and his last words, apparently, to Irene Pepperberg, which is what he said every night when she said goodnight to him in the laboratory, he would say, good night, be good, I love you. Which I always find a little Absolutely bit. heartbreaking. Oh, um, we bear in mind everybody that you just put your question and answer in the little question and answer place and we'll get to you. The next one is from Atan Blast. Um, I'm going to switch the microphone on for you. Can you speak? Can we hear from you, Atan? Okay, perhaps um, perhaps uh, that person has gone. But the question was, um, in what ways are humans different from other animals? What are some things that human beings can do that other animals just can't do or not as well? Uh, I'm sure that there's there are a lot of things that would fit that category, I'm sure. Um, well, it's, and indeed we, we do discuss um, quite a few of them in the book. Um, if I had to pick one thing that we are really, really good at compared to other primates, i.e. not compared to other animals, but compared to other primates, we are really good at cooperating. We are really good at recognising other individuals as people. We are really, really good at making, at making common cause, which is ironic because most of the stories that get told about the evolution of humans focuses on things like competition and you know, nature, red and tooth and all the rest of that. But the reason why we've been able to reshape the planet in the way that we have is because we are so good at working together, because our social institutions, our culture enables us to do that. There's an excellent book um, by the um, by the primatologist and anthropologist Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, which she basically gives an example. She says, OK, think it through. Imagine a plane full of chimpanzees. By the time that plane landed, most of the individuals on that plane would be bleeding. They would be missing fingers, they would be missing teeth, there would be dead bodies, there would be bits scattered everywhere. But we can do it. Humans can do it. A plane full of humans, you might be fairly peeved with people sitting <laughs> close to you or around you. But, you know, we managed to get along. And by and large, for all the focus on the dreadful consequences of competition and hostility and violence, we are awfully good. We are the most successful primate species when it comes to cooperation. It's something that's also very much affected our perceived history of our species because uh, and the roles that different people have to play, because arguably you could say that the role of women has been completely ignored in favour of the, you know, the, the man, the hunter, the aggressive, the lone hero thing. Whereas, in fact, there's so much protein comes from women and children scrubbing around for bugs and, you know, picking bits of vegetables and, and sharing things. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's been Woman the Gatherer, um, it, one of the things, one of the themes that Adrian Zillman um, and some of her colleagues, the theme of Woman the Gatherer um, really grew up in the 1970s as a kind of deliberate counterpoint to the man, the hunter stories. The difficulty, of course, is that stone tools tend to persist in the archaeological record and are therefore there to be seen, whereas bags that baskets are tied, don't. baskets, they don't. Yeah. All right, next question is from GT. GT, are you still there? Hello, GT. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, right. Okay. So it's, it's a comment followed by a question, really. Um, you've talked about the believed superiority, uh, I'll ask believed superiority in relation to animals. But maybe we also have a sense of inferiority regarding the, the gods. In other words, we're kind of crawling between heaven and earth. And we appreciate that. Today, many Christians will have started the day with a confession of their weakness or a confession of their sins. So my question really is, how do you see the relationship between humans and their explanation mark gods? 
Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I, I, yeah, the uh, as I said, the gods chapter in a sense is the is the outlier of the book um, because there's something ontologically different about the gods uh, because with all the other categories that we talk about, they're things that humans can look at and say, "Aha, um, those things are a bit like us, but we're different from them in that respect, this respect," and that kind of helps me. Um, formulate who I am and what my sense of identity is but of course with the gods uh, we can't see them so we have to sort of perform a triangulation there and and say well we you know we can imagine the gods are embodied in these animals or are above the clouds or uh, or wherever they may be so it's a it's a, it's a slightly different one, I think, from the from the point of view of the kind of the thesis that we're trying to explore and um, we found it very very difficult to generalize because you're you're absolutely right that the um the great monotheistic religions do kind of very much have this sense of inferiority in in relation to god uh in in some senses um but there are, of course there are many other religions uh, around the world and in history where um there's a lot of really you know uh low quality gods out there the greek gods whew, <laughs> they were dreadful I feel quite I feel pretty comfortably superior to a lot of the Greek gods they were they were bad guys um so um yeah I think it's I think it's difficult to to put um you know that sort of human relationship with the gods very very neatly into a very neat philosophical framework I think there are so many varieties of of gods through cultures and through history. Um, I mean, li linking with that, is there a sense to which you say you, you can't see the gods, but maybe people really believe that, that they could see the gods around them. The gods for many people were just as real as the cat down the road. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, it's that sort of, somebody, uh, it was Mandy mentioned the word transcendence before, that sort of sense that humans can be more, be better than they are, I guess would be perhaps the monotheistic religion's way of, of talking about it, or, or more than they are. It's a, uh, it's, it's kind of a bit of a, a bootstrapping uh, concept for humanity to, that kind of enhances perhaps what humans are, and, and at its best. Um, you know, engages those those forms of empathy and imaginative engagement that we've been talking about. In one sense, you know, it's maybe an answer to the question somebody asked earlier, you know, well, well, are there any differences between humans and animals? And we're not aware of any other animal species having gods, um, although, but then how would we know? That's a, that's a poser, isn't it? Mandy, what do you think? There's quite a few articles um, written by primatologists who are recording interesting behaviour by chimps and by other primates around things like waterfalls um, and floods and rivers. So basically uh, things that look different or strange or impressive. Um, so for, there's... and. Um, so and they're very careful, I should say, not to say, oh, look, here is an example of proto-religion. But there is some that but they're, they're, what they're identifying is some kind of odd behavior or different or distinct behavior. I mean, I think that what's I don't know, I suppose I think in, in a certain sense, what's being got at here is the sense of awe, if that makes sense an awareness of something, as I say, transcendent, something that, that you are smaller than the universe, that the universe goes beyond you and will go beyond you and will continue beyond you, which is at the heart of any kind of recognition of mortality, and which I think is very closely tied into many human experiences or sense of divinity, if that makes sense. Something that I've um, wondered about animals as well is that uh, Animals, as far as we can see, I mean, they've presumably the the relevant ECG studies have been done. And we certainly know from our own pet dogs that they go to sleep and they dream. You've seen them twitching and making noises. And presumably they have nightmares the same way that we do. So um, somebody's stumping across them or their owner is punching them in the face or something like that. They wake up and they know the difference between that and reality. So there is, they, they have um, some kind of uh, an abstract idea that 
um, hallucinogenic stuff can happen and it isn't the same as reality. Uh, so I, you know, I, I wonder the degree to which their thinking can be a little more abstract than we assume. It's hard, isn't it? Because it's it's hard for us to, for, for, for those people who've investigated things like, like hypnopolitics. Oh, stop, 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 that, that feedback's not coming through to you guys as well. Um, so psychologists and neuroscientists who've been investigating things like hypnopompic and, um, oh, well, I've forgotten what the other one is now, but those hallucinations that you get dropping off to sleep or as you're waking up, which, I mean, I get them, um, which is, you know, I, I can't count the number of times I've woken up and seen somebody standing at the bottom of my bed. A different kind of mind or a different kind of person might see that person as an alien or as an angel. You know, and that's one of the accounts that people have put forward to explain um, those who don't accept that aliens have actually been abducting Americans from their bedrooms. That's one of the accounts that people have put forward to explain why people would think that they might be. That we tend to human, again, it's an example, I would want to say, of our capacity to be inhuman, to humanise the landscape. We recognise and we want, we almost want, it's one of the reasons why, why scientists also have to work so hard not to be anthropomorphic. We want people to be like us. We want to recognise that sense of shared purpose. So, yeah, um, the difficulty in terms of trying to get animals to understand, or the, the, trying to study the kind of the, the dream life of animals would be, I think, as somebody mentioned earlier on, the issue of being able to identify a form of language in which this could be communicated if it's hard enough to do it for humans. Although I have to say, I have also waken up from a dream and been absolutely convinced the dream was real for at least the first half an hour of my waking existence. It's tremendously emotionally impactful, aren't they? Funny enough, Scott has just written in the comments here, um, Scott, who does the organisation, he said, my night hag experiences have almost always involved burglars, not monsters or aliens. So he's being incredibly, just incredibly, um, well, very real world about that. Uh, of course, the, the classic science fiction title was Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And with that, they were, he, Philip K. Dick was asking, do they have that internal uh, life that we do as well? Um, remember, everybody, that you can ask a question in the Q&A section and uh, people will be here to answer it for you or to just have a, a, a good conversation about it. Is there any other point that you guys wanted to make as a result of the conversation that we've just had, the Q&As. I'm just pausing to see if Charlotte wants to go first while I... Um, I don't think there's another point that I'd want to make. Um, I think that it's... I mean, I, I keep coming back to the issue of the divine and our sense of the divine and what it means what it means to feel a sense of communication with something that is so beyond oneself and so and so beyond understanding um it's i mean having just come through the, the christmas period and having sat down to try to explain the idea of christmas and, and the coming of the son of god to to my kids you know the idea that in order to understand us that god had to become one of us in order for us to understand god we have so that again i keep coming back to that sense of 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 of, of sharing of not quite empathy, but of recognition, I think. Yes, that makes sense. We've got Stephen here as well. Um, Stephen, can you speak? Are you able to speak? Stephen just typed in a question. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering if, can you hear me? I can see you can. We can, you're a, bit, you're a bit faint, so speak up, but we can hear you. Uh, is the need for gods? A human attribute is the need to try and create mythologies to explain the world a uniquely human attribute i think that's one of the things that that's that's one of the, the one of the questions that as i said many of the fiction writers that i was referencing earlier on have tried to explore i mean is if if another species had gods would that make them human I have to say, I'm not aware of any human society that doesn't have a sense of the divine or a sense of 
being beyond oneself in that way, Charlotte. I'm trying to remember that's, my comparative religion courses. That's a really interesting question. I can't think of any. I mean, there's sort of societies and nations that have sort of temporarily tried to squash it, but it, it it's never really worked. Um, it does seem. I'm 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 very nervous of of claiming a kind of an essential human condition that applies to all humans because that very much is against the spirit of inhumanism. But yes. but whether whether this is kind of qualitatively different somehow because it's not because it's not a physical reality in the way that um, the other the other categories are. No, I think you know. I, I think it is. It's so closely connected to to these questions of these qualities of imagination and projection and the ability to see the self through other and the other through self that constant sort of ping-ponging of identity and and Mandy you also mentioned the the apprehension of mortality as well which is uh, quite a quite a gloomy thing in some ways but but also as you say closely connected to the capacity to feel awe and wonder at something that's greater than oneself We also have a question from an anonymous attendee who would rather I ask the question on their behalf. Um, we'll call this the last question, if that's OK with everybody. Um, and that's how might this approach alter our attitude towards how we address the climate crisis? Uh, so I suppose our ability to extend our sense of selfhood, our sense of self-importance out to the whole world. That's such an important question, um, that, and that I think was very much at the back of our minds as we were trying to to shape and and flesh out this idea. It, it I, I think it's, I think something like it is 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 essential. I think it's very very clear that uh, that there is no um, or, or not only a technocratic solution to the climate crisis that we can't fix our way out of it with technology. That it's going to require. Um, a very radical extension of humanity or, or whatever we want to call it to many agents on this planet. Um, you know, it's not just the, the, the climate emergency, there's also an ecological emergency and um, our life is so interconnected with so many other species in, in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. So um, beginning by, by extending, imaginatively extending, uh, humanity to those agents seems absolutely the way to go and it's it's really interesting I, you know I'm becoming increasingly um, aware of those conflicts that are happening on the ground um, in the territories of indigenous peoples in uh, for example Canada where an oil company will come along and say well but we you know but we have the right to take the oil out of the ground and, and these people say no this is our this is our homeland this is our ancestors and it's like such a stark example of the conflict of these two different ways of looking at the world one of which we know is going to lead to disaster and death uh it's profoundly irrational as as much as anything else you know so much for the quality of human rationality um it's you know it's just, it's not going to work uh so so yeah i think it's it's really important mandy what do you think yeah, there isn't anything that I can add to what you've just said, Charlotte, and you've summed up both the position of the book and, and intriguingly also what I think as well. That was an absolutely fascinating talk for my first time um, hosting one of these talks for Conway Hall. It's, I, it's been an absolute cracker. It couldn't have been better. Thank you so much, Amanda Reese and Charlotte Slay. And thank you to all of uh, the people who have attended today as well. Remember that Conway Hall Ethical Society is a charity and it's had a hard time over the last few months, the same as everybody else has because of lockdown and because of not being able to raise as much money as uh, it usually could. Please do donate if you're one of those people who can afford to. Thank you ever so much again for the, uh, to Amanda and um, Charlotte again, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>